Well, back to the marathon lecture. I have never given back-to-back -back lectures, so. The catalog of the 1902 exhibition introduced another Beethoven house to the one Hoffmann built for this se secession. Karl Moll's two-block woodcut shows the house and street in Heiligenstadt where the composer once lived. Moll makes the street the woodcut's subject. With ha the house fronts of the Eroica Gasse plunging into depth, he transports the viewer into an alley tightening to a footpath. A strip of pavement, one walk or one walker wide, clings to the wavering plaster walls. Those uh, sidewalk is exactly the same today. The print introduces the page describing the passage to the central room, that is, the transitional space between Klimt's frieze uh, and Klinger's monument. So this woodcut, in other words, is on the facing page to where the catalog is describing the works of art that you get to if you go down the little staircase under that strange uh, overdoor around the corner to uh, Klinger. Vienna has no shortage of Beethoven houses. The composer lived in, mo uh, in more than 60 during his 35 years in the city. Vienna adorned many of these solemn abodes with plaques, allowing devotees to retrace the nomadic life of genius. The woodcut belongs to an album of Beethoven houses that Moll designed and published in 1902. Perused, these beautiful images, antiqued by the woodcut medium itself, enabled armchair pilgrims to explore Beethoven city and old Vienna itself. Happily, Beethoven chose nice places to live, especially in summer, where he took rooms in the outlying villages at the foot of the Wienerwald in Heiligenstadt, Grinzing, Mödling, and Baden. Mm -hmm. Interspersed with vineyards, the uh, woods shelter cozy outdoor restaurants where new wine flows cheaply and rustic Lendler resound. This was the quintessential landscape of Biedermeier sociability, m uh, embodied musically less by the German-born loner Beethoven than by the thoroughly Viennese Schubert. But before Schubert, there was Beethoven, whose paths through this terrain were even more ostentatiously signposted than his abodes. Wandering up the Beethoven Beg, which I uh, uh, suddenly learned yesterday was Lo uh, Adolf Loos's favorite place in the world. Wandering up the Beethoven Weg from the Eroica Gasse to the top of the Wienerwald, placards invite you to hear strains of the melodies he there composed, allegedly, while walking. At 1900, Biedermeier architecture enjoyed a renaissance, too. Loos likened the facade of his building on the Michelerplatz to the house fronts of circa 1820, where doors and windows had simple frames and the plaster rendering applied by craftsmen's hands looked naturally animated. And it is really the case that the Lowe's house uh, is not all that strange if one compares it to uh, Biedermeier facades. A livable environment then, like the Vienna championed by Camillo Sitte, the Eroica Gasse seems enlivened by a beholding subjectivity. Tear-shaped blotches model the scene inviting us empathetic, empathetically to touch the plaster and tread those cobbles, while the steep recession into space and the nervous, perhaps twilight sky convey us into an Eroica Gasse as weary travelers feeling their way home. For his admirers, Beethoven's walk and peripatetic life evidenced the restless isolation of genius. The composer contributed this myth. In a letter he, letter he wrote in Heiligenstadt in 1802, he despaired over his increasing deafness, but vowed to overcome all hardship for the sake of art. Published after his death, the Heiligenstadt Testament was exactly one century old at the time of the secession show. In Hoffmann's temple, a claim was then made that Beethoven and Vienna would find their way back home here. On October 4th, 1903, a young philosopher entered Schwarz Spanierstrasse 15, just off the ring, and mounted the stairs to the room where Beethoven died. There, at 23, the philosopher fatally shot himself. Suicides filled the back pages of Vienna's newspapers, but this one, styled as a self-sacrifice at the deathbed of genius, caused a sensation. Otto Weininger became a household name in his book, badly reviewed when it appeared earlier that year, was heralded as a work of pure genius. 
Weininger's sex and character went through 25 reprintings in its first 25, 20 years and was fervently admired by leading intellectuals such as Karl Krauss, August Strindberg, Wittgenstein, Kafka, Musil, and Joyce. Today it reads like a repugnant pseudo-philosophy. Weininger argued that the real problems of the day was the struggle between man and women. He took the struggle to be a conflict between, on the one hand, the intellectual and ethical side of human beings, and on the other hand, their material sexual side. The good side, the ethical and intellectual one, Weininger located in the ego, which for him was masculine. The bad material sexual one, he equated with the body and the feminine. To this scheme, he added a notorious corollary, probably more original. Judaism was the material feminine religion hence its modern alliance with sex and science. Quote, Jewish is the spirit of modernity. Sexuality is affirmed, and the contemporary sexual ethic sings hymns to coitus, end, end quote. Weininger sought to save the ego from psychoanalysis and from the scientific materialism of his day. More fundamentally, he sought to rescue the ego from the feminine, for the female, quote, is not only nothing, it is altogether not. However, such an ego would have to renounce sex and society, for sex and society seek union rather than individuality. Quote, the human being is alone in the universe in eternal monstrous solitude, end quote. Genius was the embodiment of ego, and Vienna's supreme genius was Beethoven. We don't know whether Weininger saw the Beethoven exhibition. Had he done so, he would have despised its program, I think. Klimt's Fries preached precisely the modern creed that Weininger abhorred and understood as Jewish. According to this creed, ethics derives from the quest for happiness, coitus gets sublimated into a kiss, and a pathway exists between union of men and women who should be fighting uh, and the solitary genius of Beethoven. Only when someone strives for extreme purity, wrote Weininger about himself, do they really become dirty. Jewish on his father's side and homosexual, Weininger felt like filth beside his ideal. Because Weininger knew he couldn't be Beethoven, he had to die. In the topography of the Secession, he would never have passed beneath Klimt's frieze to Klinger's effigy. His impure self, it could, if it could have been portrayed, uh, might resemble not the marble Beethoven, but Oskar Kokoschka's unfired terracotta self-portrait bust an ethical warrior battling its own flayed flesh. In 1902, Klinger carved the second Beethoven for Karl, Karl Wittgenstein. A year later, his son Hans, the musical prodigy, went missing in Chesapeake Bay, having taken his own life. Another son, Rudolf, soon followed, committing suicide in 1904 because, as his farewell letter explained, he has doubts about his, quote, perverted disposition, end quote. The soul, as Arthur Schnitzler wrote, ist ein weites Land, an unknown territory, and we can never know the reasons for these acts. Karl Wittgenstein did probably place impossible moral demands on his elder sons, demands personified in his home by Beethoven. Raumkunst was unlivable. It was too edgy and not just for overachievers. This cartoon from 1905 captures this demand. Darling Ada, does it really have to be pork loin again? Wieder Schweins, wieder Schweins Carré. He asks a rail thin gentleman with his hair suit and shoes cut square. And Ada says, I really cannot allow anything else to be served in this room. Raumkunst sh shapes everything, trimming the topiaries into Josef Hoffmann's cubes and admitting only Japanese, Chinese lantern plants and pork loin, Schweinskare. A boned rack of pork can indeed be pressed into a square, in German a carré. The joke exposes the rift between the sophisticate, sophisticated decor and what people personally crave. Not pork loin again! This mocks class pretense. The leisured dandy and his modern wife are really just Kurtl and Ada, dressed up and unhappy. Adolf Loos described this dilemma in his story of the poor little rich man, uh, um, published in the Neues Wiener Tagblatt in 1900. He tells of a successful businessman who has everything, but suddenly realizes uh, he needs to let art, with a capital A, into his home. 
So he hires an architect who throws out all the old furniture and brings in nothing but art. Now, when the rich man sits on his chair, he sits on art. And when he walks on his carpet, he feels feet sink into art. The problem is living now takes practice. Soon, he stays away from home. Then comes his birthday, and his loving family gives him what he really wants, a pair of embroidered slippers. Arriving late, the architect sees the slippers and falls into a rage. But you designed them yourself, said the rich man, sure of his innocence. I certainly did, thundered the architect, but for the bedroom. <laughs> Robert Musil remembers Lowe's parable. At the open of dem uh, opening of The Man Without Qualities, Musil introduces the protagonist, Ulrich, through a look at his home and house. First, we see it from outside, a little chateau, in the past perhaps a hunting lodge, nestled in an old garden in Vienna's suburbs. The city now surrounds the chateau, and later restorations make it look blurry, quote, like a double exposed photograph. But its effect is, and I quote Musil, such that people invariably stopped and said, oh. Then Musil shows us the house from inside. We find Ulrich standing behind a window, quote, gazing through the fine green filter of the garden air. With a stopwatch in his hand, he has been timing the passing cars, trucks, trolleys, and pedestrians in order to calculate the total energy of Vienna. After doing some arithmetic in his head, he slips back his watch into his pocket and laughs at his nonsense. The total effort it takes for one man just to hold himself up in traffic, he concludes, would, quote, dwarf the energy needed by Atlas to hold up the world. And one could then estimate the enormous undertaking it nowadays me takes merely to be a person who does nothing at all. At that moment, Musil adds, the man without quality was just such a person. Previously, Ulrich had uh, concluded a difficult project. After dabbling in mathematics and philosophy, he had resolved at 32 to rent the chateau and turn it into a home. Free to renovate it in any style he liked, he set about, like Ludwig Wittgenstein did for his sister, to design for himself an interior. One plan looked like a hospital clinic. Another was massive, like a great personality. A third of reinforced concrete stood slender, like an adolescent girl. Quote, Finally, he dreamt, out, uh, dreamt up only impractical rooms, revolving rooms, kaleidoscope interiors, adjustable scenery for the soul, end quote. The man without qualities then flounders, quote, his ideas steadily growing more devoid of content. So he gave up homemaking and left it to the professionals, the designers, and the decorators. In the end, these created a tasteful residence, but for a resident of their own imaginings, quote, Ulrich had returned from the moon and promptly installed himself on the moon again, end quote. Adolf Loos had a simple solution to the unhomely home. You take the Kunst out of Raumkunst and work with space alone. Loos tried to bring the house back in touch with its origins as a form of cladding. Humans covered themselves first in fur and textiles, now in tailored suits. To cover their, cover their families and create the primal home, they used or made structures on which to hang the cladding. Walls were just scaffold for textiles or fur. Architects, Loos charged, forgot this proper order of things. Quote, their imagination creates not rooms, but walls, the rooms being the spaces left, behind, left inside the walls, the rooms being the spaces left inside the walls. Loos issued this indictment in 1898, four years before Hoffmann made plaster walls his medium. Loos tried to invert this inversion, creating space first, then the walls. As he explained, a project had to be, quote, developed from the inside out. Floor and ceiling are of primary importance. The facade is secondary. The trick was to think three-dimensionally in cubic space, end quote. In Loos's practice, such thought resulted in rooms on different levels with different heights, according to their function. On the left, uh, a sunken music room, on the right, that music room projecting willfully out of the blank facade. In Corbusier, a similar thinking would later produce the so-called free plan, an architecture of floors and ceilings with no supporting walls. Raumkunst, Raumkunst had created interiors, but it treated these as exteriors, facades facing inward, as it were. Loos worked with another space, 
uh, worked with space, but not as an artist. His students coined a term for his method, Raumplan. Raumplan corresponds to Raumkunst by disavowing art. Trained as an engineer, Loos understood building functionally as fulfilling this or that need. Houses should fulfill the need for comfort, and not just for one individual, but for all users. Art is just the opposite. For Loos, art meets no need and does not have to please or be comfortable. Indeed, art should, quote, make us feel uncomfortable, end quote. A supporter of Vienna's most radical painters and composers, Loos bought Kokoschka's terracotta self-portrait at its initial exhibition, where it had been the object of intense ridicule. We love the house, wrote Loos. We hate art. This is because art is revolutionary. It thinks of the future. Art can have a place in the home, but only in very personal ways, separate from the hardware of everyday living. Loos also designed some interiors as soft, intensely personal spaces, like this cocoon-like bedroom he fashioned for his wife in 1903. A house, however, is conservative, not in the sense that it imitates the past, like the self-consciously vernacular style of the Viennese cottagen, oversized alms chalets built in the suburbs. For Loos, a house is conservative, conservative because it thinks about, because it thinks uh, on behalf of the present. Das Haus denkt an die Gegenwart. The house thinks about or on behalf of the present. It must therefore be modern, and to be modern it must be unornamented for, and that's the most famous quote of Loos, for the evolution of culture is synonymous with the removal of ornamentation from objects of everyday use. The evolution of culture is synonymous with the removal of ornamentation from objects of everyday use. Loos pronounced this dictum in 1908 in a lecture titled Ornament and Crime, although the idea originated 10 years earlier in his attack on the Viennese facade. Corbusier and Gropius acknowledged Loos as the prophet of modern architecture. From time immemorial, ornament had been at the center of architecture's rhetorical purpose. Then, just two decades after Loos called for its elimination, ornament had all but ceased to exist. But I wish to focus for a moment on Loos's, a point in Loos's argument where, paradoxically, the absence of ornament plays an ornamental role. Loos drew the title Ornament and Crime from his claim that tattoos are marks of the criminal. Quote, there are prisons where 80% of the inmates have tattoos, end quote. Primitive peoples, whom he gathers under the name Papuans, tattoo even their faces. But this comes naturally to them, he says. Anyway, Loos aims his critique neither at Papuans nor at criminals, and that's an important thing, it's supposed to be funny, but at the Viennese. They may not be tattooed, and certainly they don't want to think of themselves as tattooed, as tattooed but how they, by how they decorate their homes, they might as well be. Loos wants to shame Vienna into being modern. But he gives another quite different reason for eliminating ornament. This he puts at the end of his argument as a coda. It's the last paragraph. When people followed the herd, they had to distinguish themselves with various colors. Modern man uses his dress as a mask, end quote. What does this mean? In the past, in the era of tribes rather than societies, people belonged so tightly knit together that only through personal adornment, through colors, masks, tattoos, etc., could someone emerge as an individual. Today, people are so different from one another, so different and so individual that they require a mask to look the same. Beethoven's ninth Loos writes, wasn't written by an artist dressed in silk, velvet, and lace. Genius today wears a dark suit like everyone else. In another essay, Loos cruelly recollects his first meeting with Josef Hoffmann. To Loos, who had just returned from America, Hoffmann dressed like an artist but looked like a clown. This is his words. Loos worked, pres worked hard to preserve his outsider's perspective. By 1921, he had become leader of Vienna's effort to build housing for the homeless working poor, and his brand of modernism had become the architectural norm. But he nonetheless titled his collection Spoken into the Void, as if, it were still, as if he were still misunderstood. Not that he disparaged belonging. His seminal essay on architecture begins with a celebration of the Alpine hut. In such a pristine environment, a new villa is always an eyesore, 
the abominable product of, quote, the ruthless man, the warped man, the architect, end quote. But Vienna isn't the Alps. In the city, everyone comes from elsewhere, even people from the Alps. Nomadic but having left the herd, everyone needs a mask to fit in. In 1903, uh, Loos launched uh, Das Andere, uh, Ein Blatt zur Einführung abendländischer Kultur in Österreich. Uh, the Other, a magazine for introducing Western culture into Austria. The Viennese didn't know they needed this introduction, by the way. In this home to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, this great imperial capital of Central Europe, they watched people streaming westward towards them, peasants from Dalmatia and Siebenbürgen, boyars from Bukovina, Lasoviaks and Jews from Galicia. But to Western Western Europe, this still was Austria, Österreich, the Eastern Kingdom, where Asia, you will recall, begins at Vienna's Landstrasse, just a block from Café Prickel on the Ring. Vienna belongs to a landlord, the Habsburgs, and even they were nomads, itinerant kings from elsewhere, from their alpine airplender. Loos was a transplant to Vienna from Bruno in Moravia. He ornamented the first cover of the other with a stranger, an Englishman equipped for travel, wearing clothes available at Goldmann und Salach on the Graben. Loos had redesigned that store's interior, and in 1909 he built its flagship, which was the famous building on the Michaeler plots. Those English clothes function as Loos's mask. They are the cladding of the cosmopolitan. Modern dress, Loos wrote in 1898, is that which least, at least attracts attention to itself. Clothes should be inconspicuous, and so too should buildings. Loos designed his house on Michaeler plots with windows and rooms aligned with its neighbors, and in a plain style, recollecting a Biedermeier facade. And you can see the way that actually works. He wants it sort of to fit in. True, such plainness caused an uproar, but as Loos perfectly well predicted, it would come to look perfectly ordinary once Vienna's architecture caught up. And I sort of went into these lectures forgetting to say that the amazing thing about Loos is honestly everything does look timeless, what he does. It's just incredible, the fact that it looks really like it could have been done yesterday. More generally, uh, the modern style looked conspicuous in places not yet modern or incompletely so. Loos accepted that as champion of Western culture, he would be the other, das andere, with his English dress in Vienna. From this followed the necessary corollary, however, an article of clothing, quote, an article of clothing is modern if at an exclusive event held in the center of culture with the best society, you are least likely to attract attention. Low stress, therefore, for an elegant party in London or in Cambridge. This made him stand apart in Vienna, but not as a Moravian newcomer. He could pose as a citizen of the world. Loos took Vienna to be, in a fashion, naturally cosmopolitan. The Habsburg Empire wasn't a nation in the modern sense, but a conglomerate of territories brought together by the contingencies of war, marriage, and dynastic succession. Its cosmopolitanism, its cosmopolitanism was different from and much older than the one advocated, for example, by Immanuel Kant and Friedrich Schiller, and Beethoven for that matter, and embraced by Vienna's liberals. The idea that, as rational beings, humans belong to a single moral community. This new liberal, cosmopolitanism, new liberal cosmopolitanism suited Habsburg rule, threatened as it continually was by the ethnicities within its domain that wanted each to form their own independent nation. The Austro-Hungarian polity registered this centrifugal force even in, an, in its name. It was the dual monarchy, Kaiserlich und Königlich. It consisted of Austria, also called Cisleitania, and ruled imperially, or Kaiserlich, and it consisted of Hungary since the so-called Compromise of 1867, which was ruled royally, or Königlich, and independent from Austria. Language differences divided up the Austrian territories, and all persuasive bureaucracy faced demands, especially from the Czechs, to conduct its business in other languages besides the official German. The late Ernst Gellner described succinctly the Habsburg dilemma as a conflict between various ethnic nationalisms breaking empire asunder and cosmopolitan individualism trying desperately to keep it whole. 
Loos loathed Heimatkunst, homeland art, the pseudo-vernacular style popular in Vienna around 1910. Mocking it as a foreign imprint from Munich, he urged his city not to rusticate but to modernize. Austria revealed its backwardness spectacularly in the anniversary parade of 1908. In order to celebrate the 60th jubilee of Franz Josef's reign, representatives of the various nationalities of Austria-Hungary were brought to the capital to parade around the ring in ethnic garb. The sorry sight of these compatriots from remote corners of the empire astonished the Viennese. Karl Kraus wondered whether sheer ugliness might be the dual monarchy's new lingua franca. Los was just as cruel. In Austria, we still have tribes living in the fourth century. Happy the land that does not have so many cultural stragglers. Happy America, end quote. Fourth century Austria, you may recall, was precisely the barbarous epoch that the art historian Regal uncovered in those perforated bronzes dug up from the Danube shore. As historian Daniel Purdy has persuasively argued, for Los, ornament itself was the physical mark of not being modern. Linked to place and ethnic identity, its profusion in Vienna revealed the, uh, revealed the city's still tribal state. Jews, by a contrast Los makes, exemplifies an opposite tendency. Unlike the nationalists who donned peasant garb, Viennese Jewish population energetically sought to assimilate themselves. Quote, never have I heard, this Los, never have I heard a Jew in Western clothing insist that the Jews of Galicia should stick to their caftans, wrote Los in the, in the inaugural issue of Das Andere. Of all the ethnic groups, the Jew had the most to gain from uh, cosmopolitanism. Europe's pariah people, they had succeeded in carving out for themselves a special place in Viennese culture. They, understand that they had understood that their existence depended on the Habsburg Empire's peculiar brand of cosmopolitanism, where a pragmatic pluralism coexisted with ancient prejudices. They also knew, and their city's anti-Semitic demagogues told them so, that they would not be so easily admitted to the ethnically defined nations which were struggling to break free. Theodor Herzl's Zionism was born in Vienna. It was a fateful response to the fact that the Jews had no homeland in Austria. Even recently, in an exhibition on Alt Österreich mounted last year at the Albertina, Jews were portrayed as wayfarers. One portrait of a rabbi stood in a vitrine different from the other, set apart from the cheerful story about peoples and lands. Although Los wasn't Jewish, his supporters and two of his wives were. For Stephen Beller, in our audience, in his pioneering study of Vienna and the Jews, Loos exemplifies a peculiar double assimilation. Jews assimilated themselves into a culture, assimilating itself reciprocally to them. Loos's worry about the visibility of the Galician Jews, who were arriving in the city in great numbers, was an anxiety shared by many second and third generation Viennese Jews, including, I would add, by my father's parents in Leopoldstadt. The kaftan, my grandparents believed, made Jews too visible. In an unpublished manuscript cited by Purdy, Loos draws a fascinating parallel between ornament and the Eastern European shtetl. And here's the quote. Every champion of Jewish emancipation, every opponent of the ghetto must be pained when emancipated Jews adopt the de designs of the secession. For these designs are the new kaftan, a new Jewish ghetto, end quote. Loos's animus against the secessionists is well known. His association of their ornamental style with Jewish identity is perhaps less familiar. It uncovers a secret about the Viennese interior. Earlier I showed a caricature of Olbersch's building inscribed with the Yiddish word for madness, meshuge. That word may have been current in Viennese dialect of the cartoon's originator, Edward Purzel, Purzel also having dubbed the building Cabbage Head. By calling it Meshuge, Purzel, the satirist, brands the secession as crazy, bonkers, out of its mind, but in a specifically Jewish way. Turning their language against him, he implies, I think, that Jews are themselves Meshuge for building this thing in Vienna. The most violent reaction to Klimt's art and the art of his circle were openly anti-Semitic, as is well known. The Deutsches Volksblatt railed against Klimt's Jewish impudence, that's their word, even though the painter wasn't a Jew. 
and that paper, paper mocked the Beethoven statue for the, quote, Jewish Freemason from Leipzig, Max Klinger. Along these lines, a cartoon in the satirical journal Kikeriki depicts Klinger's Beethoven avenging himself against the symphony botcher Mahler, who at the time suffered anti-Semitic attacks for his new elaborated orchestration of the Ninth Symphony. Loos's attack on ornament takes on a new meaning. Modern cladding allows stigmatized others to dwell inconspicuously in a home inhospitable to them. Raumkunst, by contrast, looked Jewish to everyone except perhaps its makers and admirers. Lux praised the Beethoven exhibition by exclaiming, we aren't Assyrians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, or Japanese, but Europeans of this 20th century, to which Purzel would have replied, you are none of the above, and your modernity is just your Jewishness in disguise. Karl Kraus spoke the unspoken already in 1900 in a review published in his journal Die Fackel. The liberal press, Kraus observes wryly, called visitors to the secession's current exhibition orthodox followers of the secession. Quote, one couldn't refer more delicately to the secession's confessional stratum. Just as every aristocrat used to have his house Jew, so today every stockbroker has his house secessionist. Mr. Mull is famously art agent to the broker Zierer and the coal user Barrel. And Mr. Klimt teaches secessionist painting to Mrs. Lederer. This convergence between modern painting and money proud Hebrews, this advancement of Raumkunst, which intends to give the ghetto the look of a home, which intends to give the ghetto a look of a home, uh, occasions the prettiest hopes. Olbrich already dreams of taking Otto Wagner's designs and trumping them with a new city temple with decorations by Josef Hoffmann and Kolo Moser, of course. And who has admired in the recent exhibitions the flowerings of the celebrated Jewish taste, he says it in French, the goût juif. Who has not uh, 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 admired this taste will not dismiss all of this as mere idle dreams, end quote. Krauss treats the secession's Jewishness as if it were a well-guarded secret. When the press refers to orthodox followers, they mean simply zealous ones, but secretly or unconsciously, uh, Krauss mockingly insinuates, the press means Jewish followers. Jews also, according to Krauss, famously employed secessionist artists, suggesting this is an open secret, but they also surreptitiously plan a secessionist synagogue. Krauss was Jewish, and so was much of his readership. Were they surprised by these revelations? And if they were, did they feel threatened by them? And if so, why? We need to revisit Vienna's unhomely home. In the Beethoven freeze, Klimt showed the ego to be not master in his own home, as you remember. Posed as knight in ancestral Habsburg armor, this ego, however displaced, uh, was meant to be universal a self at odds with its own unconscious, but nonetheless the self that all human beings possess. Otherness, strangeness, foreignness, the, un the enemy forces of Typhus and his daughters, all this is supposed to lie inside us. The foreigner, therefore, is neither a race nor a religion, because we are all of us unknown to ourselves. We are all of us familiar or family to each other, hence Schiller and Beethoven's kiss of universal peace and hence Mahler, Beethoven's modern Jewish champion in Maximilian's garb. But although the secessionists confessed the foreignness of themselves, they seem to have repressed or overlooked the fact that they had remained racially and religiously foreigners in Vienna. To Purzel and Karl Loewiger, Vienna was familiar, homely. It was the Jews who were strange and unhomely, and that caused Vienna to be an unhomely place for the Jews. Of course, many large European cities experienced their modernity as alienating. And many large cities generate a, a rich art and literature about estrangement. But Vienna, I think, was distinct in that its dilemma was expressed by and about a religiously and ethnically estranged minority. And in this, Vienna foreshadows dilemmas which we today term post-colonial. This makes the city a harbinger of our present. But what about the author of Das Unheimliche? Edward Engelmann's camera caught Freud at home, gazing sideways at the antique figures that crowd his desk. Two months earlier, on the 12th of March, 1938, German troops had rolled into Austria. 
In the Imperial Forum on the Ring, Hitler had addressed a vast jubilant crowd. In his study, with the window curtain, windows curtain closed, Freud wrote in his diary, Finis Austria. This was also the end of psychoanalysis in Vienna. It had been a treatment practiced almost exclusively by Jews for Jews, and now it was rapidly and completely liquidated. Freud knew he would have to leave quickly, though the arrangements took almost three months to make. He worried about his collection of antiquities that they would be confiscated. Quote, the shipper is lurking in the background, wrote Freud to his sister-in-law a week before this photograph was taken. These precious ornaments, these household gods, as Freud liked to call them, they had been his rewarding friends, drawing him into their mysteries, their myths. For patients who marveled at the profusion, they, trigger, they served to trigger memories and associations. This assisted the talk that, in Freud's practice, functioned as the cure. Indeed, Freud's antiquities symbolized, uh, symbolized psychoanalysis itself. Freud once told a patient that the analyst was like an archaeologist in his excavations, quote, he must uncover layer after layer of the patient's psyche before coming to the deepest, most valuable treasures. The retrieved memories of childhood thus found objective correlatives in the unearthed fragments of the past, of humanity's past. Here are the figures that faced Freud at his desk, Egyptian, Greek, Etruscan, Roman, Chinese treasures. Engelmann's photographs have made Freud's house the most famous Viennese interior, I think. Visiting Bergasse 19 today, entering the entrance door where the swastika hung, arriving at Freud's apartment with its peepholes still operable, one is haunted by those photographs shot on the ninth hour of Jewish Vienna. Engelmann recalled the danger of his undertaking. The police had twice interrogated Freud's daughter, Anna, and Nazi authorities watched Freud's house closely because in their eyes, he was the founder and organizer of the dangerous Jew Jew Jewish pseudoscience of psychoanalysis. Jewish himself, Engelmann snuck his Roloflex camera and tripod into Bergasse 19 and took the photos with the blinds closed and without extra lighting while around him people prepared for departure. Freud left for Vienna just nine days after Engelmann shot his last roll. It was within this tumult that a curious event took place. It left its trace on several photographs taken of the table in the consulting room directly, uh, uh, directly in front of Freud's famous chair. In some photos, there are only ancient figurines. In others, uh, these statuettes have been pushed back a bit in order to make room for a pair of silver cups. It was only recently that these were noticed and identified as kiddush cups from circa 1900. The one on the left features the tablets of the law held by two rampant, li rampant lions, symbols of the tribe of Judah. Lost between Vienna and London, these two cups and a bronze Hanukkah lamp are the only objects of Jewish ritual in Freud's collection. Their nervous presence in the photographic record raises the question, were these objects of recent manufacture in fact part of the collection, or were they something different? not costly antiques, but family heirlooms handed down perhaps by his father. The research staff of the Freud Museum in London has argued that the cups were not present at first and then removed. Rather, they were introduced belatedly, probably on the final day of the three-day shoot, and probably by Freud's wife, Martha, or by Anna, their daughter, because they supervised Engelmann's activities. If this is correct, then one of these women wanted to document, document the cups by placing them among the costly antiquities. Perhaps she also wanted to make sure that they would get packed and arrive safely at the other end. After all, like the Torah, the tables of the law have long been understood as movable territory for Jews in exile. This coming and going would not be so uncanny were these not Kiddush cups. Kiddush is the ritual blessing recited over wine to sanctify the day of rest. The Torah requires Jews to keep and to remember the Sabbath. This remembrance ritual for which the cups were made was the central one in the Jewish home, for it fulfilled the commandment never to forget. Freud maintained a strict, strictly secular household. Before marrying, he forced Martha, his fiancée, who came from an observant family, to give up all rituals and consent to eating pork. Describing himself famously as a completely godless Jew, 
He worried that psychoanalysis, practiced mainly by Jews, would be stigmatized as a Jewish science, that is, as a symptom of the specific ethnic identity rather than as a universal science of the human soul. Freud's antiquities collection supported this cosmopolitan claim. Like the secession, perhaps, it gathered together all archaic human cultures by claiming also to be completely modern and valid for everyone. Like the secession, Freud's collection also excluded Jewish antiquity. And like the secession, this ex exclusion may have been aimed at least partially at clients. Mostly secular Jews like himself, Freud's patient, patients may have not wanted to explore their psychic interior in a therapeutic space marked explicitly as Jewish. The Jewish identity of Vienna's assimilated Jews arrived not from their beliefs and practices, but from outside, from a society that branded them as Jewish. As Freud recalled in 1926, I considered myself German intellectually until I noticed the growth of anti-Semitic prejudice in Germany and German Austria. Since that time, I prefer to call myself a Jew. Anti-Semitism uh, forced secular assimilated Jews to realize that key aspects of their lives were still determined by ancestral choices that they had repudiated. Jeanne Marie portrayed the force of this realization a survivor of Auschwitz from the, uh, Austria, he described it as an answer to the question, how much home does a person need? True nostalgia, Amory wrote, true nostalgia was not self-pity, but self-destruction. It considered of the piece-by-piece -piece dismantling of our past, which could not go forward without scorn and hatred towards the lost self." End quote. The Nuremberg Laws made Jews not simply non-citizens and, and have nowhere to go, Expelled, expelling them from what for generations had been their home, it made them foreign to their own history and to themselves. Those kiddush cups readied for packing, and with them the photographic record of the interior of Freud's apartment and offices, were preludes to departure. Exile is already stamped on them. Exile of this kind is the disappearance of both place and time, the disappearance of a past. It turns history into a vexed prehistory that ob eludes objective telling. Freud observed that repetition can be power a powerful cause for feelings of the uncanny, of the unheimliche. He gives the example of a walk he took through the deserted streets of some Italian town. Chance brought him to a district where prostitutes, uh, painted women as he called them, uh, stood in the streets. Um, Freud hastened, uh, stood in the windows. Freud hastened away, but the mazy streets brought him back to the women, where his presence, he writes, was beginning to attract attention. He hurries away again, but again comes back to the same street. And now the uncanny hits him with force. He repeats his steps, but he didn't want to. The painted women who misread his intention make his terror worse, for to them as to the world his return looks voluntary where to him something else makes him return, not just once, but twice, and potentially forever. Exile has a similar structure for Vienna's assimilated Jews. It repeated the fate of their people, the never-ending history of exile that scripture and ritual commanded them to remember. But exile repeated a history they did not feel part of. More terribly, Vienna under Hitler told them that it had never been their history, never been their home, and that everyone else but them knew it. At 1898, it looked like home was just around the corner, either as the aesthetic refuse, refuge of Raumkunst or as um, uh, Loos's Cosmopolis. In retrospect, from the vantage point of 1938, all the homemaking we have explored looks like a prelude to exile. Loos led guided tours of his apartments, the ones he decorated. He termed, the, termed these Wohnungswanderungen, literally home wanderings, and published a description of them in 1907. The word emphasizes movement from place to place. It would be interesting if I had another hour, and I'm sure you're glad I don't, um, to wander various Viennese interiors as rehearsals of exile. One stop would be 1st District, Dorothea Gasse 3, Graben Hotel, Room 33. Peter Altenberg settled here in permanent transition with a postcard collection as his best companion. Second stop, 
third district, corner of Parkman, Parkgasse and Kunmangasse, Stoneborough House. Ludwig Wittgenstein, living in a gardener's shed, was persuaded to design for his sister Margaret a modernist villa. His other sister, Hermine, deemed it unlivable, quote, more a dwelling for the gods. The tour would take in imaginary homes as well, like the apartment Franz Kafka created for Josef K., with its bare, bizarrely porous walls. I'll make only one last stop. Uh, second district, Amtauber 13. Home envelops its inhabitants. It is winter, and a heavy drapery spans the walls and lines the window. Like a cloth of honor backing holy personages, this crimson plush also frames and shrouds the parents. The father has dozed off while reading in his tonette rocker, his thumbs marking the page where he left off. The mother, sitting close against the table, knits lace for a curtain. Drapery, bookshelves, chairs, and that voluminous chandelier press inward, sealing everything inside this interior. Observed from above, from a vantage point of memory and dream, the table gathers traces of childhood. The board game still playable, the string mischievously tangled through the chandelier that ends at the mother's fingers as the undivided focus of her eyes. A miniature homecoming, the string becomes the lace she knits. And it also made the lace on which it lies bald, that mesmerizing vortex of ornament decorating the table sewn by the mother's hand. In Latin, ornament, or natus, translates the Greek word cosmos. From that perspective, decor isn't superfluous. It is the very order of the world. My father's parents loved their home so deeply that they were, uh, my father's parents loved the home so deeply that when uh, Hitler came, they refused to leave it. As a child, my father was proud of his beautiful home, das schöne Heim. His parents hoped, as my grandfather said, that the troubles would blow over them like a winter wind. Of his entire extended family, only my father managed to escape and survive. In his painting, the traces of his former belongings are already omens of exile. The plaster mask up in the upper left is that of Dante, whose words on the gates of hell my father liked to intone. Through me the way to the, through, to, through me the way to the doleful city, through me the way to eternal pain. Outside, through the window, when ex uh, th outside, uh, through the window, one expects to be to see blank windows, and instead there are people ominously looking back. My father returned to Vienna in 1946. He had served as a courtroom artist at the War tri Crimes Tribunal in Nuremberg. An unexpected furlough allowed him to, uh, to return back to the ruins of his childhood home. Carrying a Leica camera, which he now used to capture motifs to paint, he shot this photograph of Amtauber 13. His apartment had been on that top floor where only the back wall still stands. My father reports that it was only when, through the camera's lens, he looked up to that space he loved, that it was only then that the weight of his loss came home to him. From now on, the Viennese interior would always be a mystery. It would remain what it had been for him in America when he portrayed it from memory, a Sehnsucht. Because he brought us, his family, with him to Vienna, because he made his family in our own strange way at home in that city, my father's longing also has become my own. Hence this home wandering that I have submitted to you for discussion. I thank you uh, for your concentration.